While the works of Afrocentric scholars like Cheikh Anta Diop, Ivan Sertima, and others have proclaimed, based on all kinds of research and the theory of evolution, that the cradle of human life is Africa, there has been very little interest by the Chinese and indeed other populations in Asia to accept that their origin is in Africa until recently. This lack of interest is in spite of overwhelming genetic data that points to Africa as the wellspring of modern humans. Chinese researchers kept insisting that fossils from China were different from African fossils. They did not subscribe to the idea that all humanity evolved out of Africa. So, why has China been reluctant to embrace their out-of-Africa origin? Why are they now more willing to embrace the out-of-Africa origin? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Um, subscribe and turn on your notification button so you know when we have new episodes. She also share our videos with your contacts. Now, in 1929, Chinese researchers discovered a nearly complete ancient skull that they claimed was roughly half a million years old. They named the fossil Peking Man, and it was one of the earliest human remains ever uncovered. And Chinese researchers said they were convinced that humanity first evolved in Asia. The site, which is on the outskirts of uh, Beijing, draws hundreds of thousands of visitors each year, including impressionable students. They continue to believe this even after discoveries in Africa that have yielded much older remains of ancient humans. Now, while the exact details of the story of the origin of humans vary from one telling to another, the key characters and events generally remain the same, just as the conclusion that the all human life evolved out of Africa. Researchers have shown that Homo erectus first evolved in Africa over 2 million years ago. Then, a little under 600,000 years ago, Homo erectus evolved into a new species, Homo heidelbergensis. The earliest, oldest evidence of this species was found in Ethiopia. It was some members of this species that were believed to have left Africa around 400,000 years ago. Some went and established themselves in the Middle East and spread to Europe, where they evolved into Neanderthals. Another set of Homo heidelbergensis, which left Africa, headed east, where they evolved into Denisovans. Evidence of Denisovans was first discovered in Siberia in 2010. The population of Homo heidelbergensis, which remained in Africa, eventually evolved into a species called Homo sapiens. Then these early humans expanded their range to Eurasia, where they replaced local hominins with a minuscule amount of interbreeding. However, until recently, Chinese paleontologists and some of their supporters from the West insisted that the fossils found in Asia were evidence that Peking man was an ancestor of the uh, for modern Asian people. Uh, to be quite honest, there are so many theories out there 
about attempts to cover up the early presence of Africans in Asia and the fact that uh, the first three dynasties and emperors of China were African. There are theories which state that the original Chinese people called Li Min and the original Japanese called Ainu were Africans. There are claims about ancient books written to prove the presence of Africans in early Asia. One theory elaborates how China's first dynasty uh, was founded by Emperor Tang or Ta, who was black. Some insist that the earliest documented rulers of China was uh, the Shang or Chang dynasty, which dated from around 1500 to 1008 BC, which is credited with forming the first cohesive Chinese civilization. This theory, uh, the theory proposes that Shang was also known as Na Qi, which has been translated to mean Na for black, Qi man. Several other achievements have been credited to these black Chinese, such as calligraphy that has lasted till to the present day, and the establishment of a structured government, um, social institutions, and numerous other cultural inventions, inventions, like the Book of Change, also called I Ching, a system of philosophy. Also, pyramids found in Japan and China have been compared to those found in Africa. Even the famous tomb of Qin Shi Huang Yi, guarded by um, army of uh, terracotta soldiers and the Great War of China have all been credited to black people who are said to have reigned there. The list is almost endless. My intention here is neither to prove or disprove the veracity of these claims. I leave that to researchers who have the necessary skills to dig deeper and come out with verifiable evidence so that the matter can be put to rest. Unfortunately, even the most respected academics do not operate without some level of bias. Often, researchers go into fields with what they call hypotheses, which they then work hard to prove. Often though, not always, their proof rests on preconceived notions. Which is why, for eons, we had people researching, writing, and showing proof that Africa had no contribution to world civilization, even though, as it turns out, it was not true. However, I strongly urge us to pay close attention to the fact that suddenly, in the past decade or so, China has decided to pour millions of dollars a year into excavations. And the government is setting up a million dollar laboratory to extract and sequence ancient DNA. This sudden interest to align China's origin should be closely monitored. Please watch this extract from a Chinese government funded video. Artifacts thought to be more than a thousand years old. Some scholars argue this collection of pottery and coins is proof of China's ancient links to the African continent. China and Africa have a history more than a thousand years based on the scholars' work. So that means uh, the people between these two countries, they already communicate and trading for a long time. But now the current, the recent years, because of China's uh, economic reform, now become the second economic power of the world. So the China, I think they want to share their experience with the African friends. Some say Chinese goods were transported all the way up the Mediterranean Sea to Kenya, Somalia, Tanzania and Zambia over a thousand years ago. Dr. Ian McIntosh says the symposium is a chance to uncover China's age-old ties to Africa 
and also encourage further studies. Well, one of the major uh, reasons for holding the meeting is to, uh, to encourage research partnerships between Chinese scholars, European scholars and African scholars. The silk route trade between China and the ancient Somali kingdom, shipwreck archaeology in the Red Sea and Chinese historical records about Africa have been among the topics discussed. This symposium is part of the 10th anniversary of the Confucius Institute. It's hoped there'll be more to come. Clementine Logan, CCTV. Now, if this relationship to Africa, which has long been proclaimed by others, is true, why has it taken so long for the Chinese to admit it? Why did they keep insisting on the myth of the Peking man until recently? Was it a case of national pride or blatant racism? Let's briefly look at the ways in which black people have been treated in China. One of the reports about the way African students are treated in China come from back in the year um, 1986 when African students marched in Beijing against racism. They did so again in 1989 and were even supported by a few Chinese students who boycotted classes to protest attacks on black students when an African man was assaulted for dating a Chinese woman. While the future is unclear regarding the conditions of black migrants in China, their marginalized positions will most likely remain the same if nothing is done to change it. We can see their condition that's the condition of the migrants, uh, the black migrants, from the ways in which the pandemic has made black people even more vulnerable to harassment and social exclusion in China. It is apparent that anti-black racism is embedded in Chinese politics and society. All you need to do is conduct a simple search online and through social media to find evidence of how, on a daily basis, black people in Asia contend with virtually government-sponsored racism. Black migrants in China are forced to live on the margins of Chinese society because they are denied proper access to health care. They continue to suffer cultural and linguistic difficulties, political and all forms of marginalization. They are denied access to decent housing and are constantly harassed by law enforcement agents. They also have to face draconian immigration policies that purposely complicate their legal status in China. Meanwhile, in Africa, China is as ruthless and self-interested as the West. While on the surface, it looks as if it is fostering growth in Africa through its mix of uh, credit and construction, it is also boosting corruption and autocracies. Chinese firms make no bones about mistreating African workers, in, even in Africa, and harming our ecosystems, while the Chinese government blocks critical coverage in the media and the dangle aid in return for African support in the UN. The Deputy Commissioner of the African Union, Kwesi Kwate, tries to caution the Chinese ambassador, and I quote, Africa values its relationship with China, but not at any price. Further acts of brutality meted out to Africans will not be countenanced by the African Union and indeed all Africans. These words 
of caution, however, seem to have fallen on deaf ears, especially since it has not been followed by concrete actions. As such, I believe that rather than focusing on celebrating the possibility that Africans were responsible for so much of China's civilization, it is more expedient for African nations to crack down on Chinese activities and presence in Africa, as well as China's inhospitality to black people in China. We need to acknowledge and embrace this new and acknowledge um, source of their origin. But more, it is more important to know our strength and use it to reposition ourselves. We must question why China suddenly finds it beneficial to claim its African connection now. We need to focus on the fact that Africa is the future, while China's population which has been the backbone of its economic success, is dwindling and it has been predicted that it will be overtaken by India. Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee um, so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe and turn on your notification buttons. Don't forget to share our videos with all your contacts and keep your comments coming. Thank you.